for those who don't know, uh, I've been a professional photographer for a while, but I'm also the director of marketing at Lexar, so I get to do both things, which is really cool. Um, but as I always start out all of my presentations, I tell you that I'm not going to be slamming product information down your throat. I think there's a, actually, I don't think there's any slides about it. So just buy Lexar, okay? There. <laughs> all right, we're good. So uh, welcome. <clears throat> it's nice to have everybody here. It's cool to have a full house. This is always fun. Um, we're doing something completely different this time. I've taught here, I don't know, countless times now. I love it. It's always fun to do. Um, for those of you who saw me talk this morning, you know that I'm very passionate about photography. Um, and for nothing more than just the fact that I really love doing it. And um, you know, I, I think in previous videos, people are misconstrued with a lot of information. But it's just as simple as I love it. I don't, a lot of times, I don't even do it for the money. Um, that's, you know, it's just the, the feeling of getting a great shot. But what I thought about with this one was, what can I do to teach a class that's not just PowerPoint presentation, but that's more hands-on? So we're in a whole new realm here today, uh, where we're going to spend really the bulk of the time uh, in Photoshop and uh, not going through a bunch of images. So um, if you want to see a bunch of my images, tough. <laughs> you have to go to my website or my blog. Um, and actually, the blog, I, I, I was saying earlier, the blog, I, I always put um, images up about every week. I talk about how I shot them. Sometimes I'll even talk about how I edited uh, the photos. But um, the blog kind of started as just something for my friends and family and has turned into a life of its own. Um, but it's, uh, it's cool because it's like my own personal journal for the last God knows how many years. But I get to share, you know, like I said, photos, but also tips and stuff. It's, it's fun. So, um, so today. What are we, so here's what I was thinking. What I realized uh, a couple months back was that all of my editing I'm doing, really, no matter whether it's a portrait, a landscape, an event shot, the Olympics, whatever it might be, most of the things I'm doing in Photoshop are really like 15. We'll call it 15. That's what it's called. It might be 17. We might, we'll figure it out. But there might be a couple bonus ones in there. But really, 90% of what I'm shooting is edited with maybe 15 or less features in Photoshop. So the idea here is to, I almost called it like the 2,000 things you don't need to know about Photoshop. <laughs> because really, I mean, Photoshop is unbelievable. And they have all these amazing features and 3D and all this. And it's like, uh, I don't use any of that or very little of it. And so the idea here is to show you um, what I use as my 90% rule um, for almost all images. Does it mean that, that everybody's going to agree with me or, or that that's going to you know, uh, be everything that you're going to do? I don't know. Uh, but hopefully it'll help you at least to determine um, the, you know, one way to, to edit photos. So um, before I start, I'll, I'll, as, this is how you can find me. Uh, I'm everywhere. <laughs> Actually, I'm on Facebook at Jeff Cable Photography, on my blog, which is jeffcable.blogspot.com. And also, all of this can be got to from my website, which is just jeffcable.com. Good that I spelled my name correctly. Um, so here's the agenda. <clears throat> six slides, as opposed to the typical 95. We're six. And then we're going to get into um, ACR, Adobe Camera Raw, which is part of Photoshop. And Photoshop. And then we do questions and answers. And uh, much to um, their dismay here, I may even take questions during. <laughs> Um, but we'll try to keep them to a minimum. So anyway, here is why it's important. <clears throat> if you're shooting professionally, how many people here shoot professionally? Okay, Time is money. Uh, and I've taught events, uh, how to shoot events here before. And we talk about this. But time is money. And if you're not shooting professionally, time is still time. Um, for someone like me, where I'm uh, at Lexar five days a week shooting uh, on weekends, um, and I still have a family, so and I travel all the time. So time is extra tight for me, and I, and I want to try to you know get stuff done and spend time with, with the family, but I also want to be efficient in the work that I'm doing and get more time behind the camera as opposed to in front of the computer. Um, being uh, that was supposed to be timeliness, not timeless, <laughs> but timeliness can be your differentiator. And really, like one of the things that people are always amazed by when I when I shoot is how quickly I turn it around. So Saturday, I shot myself and my second shooter shot two bar mitzvahs. I went through all 5,000 images, or 4,500, 
uh, pared them down, found the best ones, posted to a gallery, all by s the next day, Sunday, by around 3 p.m. <clears throat> and um, when I'm at the event, I'm projecting images that same day, sometimes within an hour, like during the party, I'll actually proje project what I just shot immediately. So to me, the immediacy, immediacy is the world we live in with Facebook and Twitter and all these things. People want to see stuff quickly. Um, I don't typically edit when I do a slideshow. It's just what I shot and up. But I do want to go through them quickly because when someone orders images, they typically order 80 or 100 for an album. I need to get through those quickly um, <clears throat> for all so many reasons. So as I said, I want to be efficient. My 90% rule, 90% of what you're seeing um, today is what I do to edit a photo. They're fairly, some of them are fairly simplistic and some are a little bit more advanced, but I don't think any of them are so advanced that we're going to lose you, hopefully not. Um, you need to know what you need to know, but you also need to know what you don't need to know. Good Lord, did I just say that? Um, <clears throat> I mean, like I said, there's a lot of stuff in Photoshop that, um, and, and there are some things that sometimes I'll break into and try, you know, liquefy. Mm -hmm. How many people are here have used liquefy in Photoshop? Um, there's times when someone's chin will need a little bit of tucking or whatever, and I'll do that. A little bit, not a lot. Um, but really, what we're talking about is the bulk of images and not the little esoteric stuff today. And again, the goal is to shoot more. Okay, so um, this is my equipment, and I, I'm trying to keep it simple here, but really, I'm a Mac guy and always have been, so I use a Mac Pro. I do use a 30 inch display, and I gotta say, I really love editing on a large display. It doesn't have to be a 30, 24, 27 is fine, but um, the larger display makes a huge difference when editing because I'm seeing much more detail. I, I gotta be honest with you, I edited. Uh, everything from the Olympics uh, from my laptop, so it can be done. It's not the best, but it works. Uh, but I really love having a big display. Um, I do use uh, solid state drives. For those of you who have never used one, and actually that's one of the things that's on my, my contest right now, but um, an SSD is amazing because it's all memory. There's no spinning plattered hard drive, which I love because my machine runs faster, and that means Photoshop runs way faster. Uh, believe it or not, when I'm processing. I have tons of, someone asked uh, in the earlier session, like how do you store all your images? I do have a lot of hard drives at my house. Um, I've got a total of about 40 terabytes of hard drive space at my house right now. Um, and uh, I do crisscross drives between home and my office. So that God forbid, if I ever had a fire, I have all the images. I do obviously use all Lexar cards and readers because they are the best. Um, I print on the Epson 2000, R2000 printer. I also have an R3000, I don't use it as much, believe it or not, as a 2000. And then my mobile setup, which is this here, which is my MacBook Pro um, with the SSD. I do use external drives because, frankly, the SSD isn't large enough for the amount of images that I'm shooting. And again, I use uh, uh, Lexar cards and readers for that. <clears throat> so here's some important time savers for you. First of all, and this one's really important, how many people here are using color calibration on their monitors? <clears throat> okay, not even half. This is, uh, this is critical because the color calibrators that you can buy here, I use the Spider 4 um, calibrator. There's lots of different ones out there and they're all pretty good. Um, what these do is it's a piece of hardware, it hooks up to your USB port and, and you literally hang it on your monitor and it runs color patterns and it measures those patterns and then adjusts your monitor. The reason this is really important is, and the reason I actually put this in the presentation is the day before I flew out here, which was yesterday, um, my neighbor said to me, <clears throat> you know, I keep printing my photos wherever she's printing them, and they keep coming up really red. Well, it turns out that her monitor's not calibrated, so she's saying, ooh, those aren't red enough. So she's adding red, and then the pictures come back and they're over-saturated. So if you calibrate your monitor, you will tr see the true colors, and therefore when you go to print, you'll get that back. So. So part of what we're going to talk about today is making sure that the brightness and contrast is all correct. Part of that is it making sure that your monitor is correct first as a starting point. Okay, so um, that's one. The Wacom tablet. Uh, I've, I brought one with me. This is uh, the the smaller size one. The graphics tablet. The thing I love about the tablet, which is great, is that um, it it's pressure sensitive, so I can just touch it, and if I touch hard, it makes a fatter 
uh, brush, and if I touch lightly, it's thinner. So as I'm editing out hair and things that we'll do today, you'll see that it's just really, really easy and efficient. And again, it's all about time savings. So um, you know, I don't work for these guys, but they're just, it's a phenomenal product. I'm the only photographer that goes to the Olympics and brings three of these with me. So I have one in the press center, one at my condo, and one in the whatever venue I'm shooting that travels with me. And then a program called Photo Mechanic, um, which we're not going to talk about too much today, but um, Photo Mechanic is a program I use for going through and culling through all of my images to find the ones that I want to edit. So it's very high speed. It doesn't do like Lightroom or Aperture where you can do all your adjustments. It's strictly for really picking out which ones are keepers and which ones are not. <laughs> all right. So um, the one plug I'll put in here for, for Lexar is the cards are faster, and to me, all of it is about speed when I'm shooting. Um, some, not, not so much in camera uh, as much as afterwards, unless I'm at the Olympics, then I'm blasting out tons of images. But really, if I'm shooting an event, like a bar mitzvah or a wedding at home, I want to go through them really quickly because I'm building a slideshow on site. I want to go through them really fast. Or even when I get home, it's the difference between staying up till midnight or staying up till 3 in the morning. So I like to be able to also read really quickly. So I used high-speed cards, high-speed readers, and a fast computer uh, to kind of all marry it together. So the, as I mentioned, the computer has a solid-state drive in it. These, when I first presented uh, solid-state drive, or SSDs, a couple years ago here, most people had never heard of them, and they were incredibly expensive, like 1500 bucks for a 128 gig. Now you can buy a 128 gig for like 100 and something dollars. So if you haven't uh, looked at changing out your hard drive for an SSD, it basically, to make it easy, it's like having a memory card in your computer instead of a hard drive. And it's just incredibly fast. Uh, like I said, they're not expensive. They use uh, less power. There's no heat buildup. Uh, you can also drop them. Not that I recommend it, but you can. You could literally put it through a washer and dryer, probably, and still all your data is going to be there. So don't recommend that either. <laughs> all right, so here's my process for. Um, going through my images, and, and then we're going to go into, we'll, we'll get into Photoshop here in a minute, but it's shoot first, obviously. And actually, even before shooting, there's a lot of prep, right? Ch charging batteries and all that good stuff. Uh, but I'll shoot first. I download. Again, I, I try to download as fast as possible. And then I go through, my first pass through all my images is to delete the ones that are either not in focus the way I want or the duplicates. So when I do a family portrait, I never just take one shot. I generally will do three, four, or five. If it's a large group, I might do more to find the one that's really good. But inevitably, sometimes I'll end up with three or four that are all good, but they're all very similar. So I'll pare it down. Typical day of shooting might be 2,500 images. I'll try to pare it down around maybe 1,800 images or whatever it might be. Then I classify them. So now that I've gotten rid of the stuff I don't really need, now I've got the 1,800. I'll pull through the 1,800 and say, which ones do I want the client to see? Okay. So typically, that'll end up around five or 600 for the client to see. And what I do is I just kind of mark them. You'll notice the color coding here. I color code the ones I like. Then I go through and I do a batch. I do a rename of all those files. I rename them, rename them to uh, whatever the event is. So I always start with the, the date. So 2013-0213 underscore b &H presentation, whatever it might be. I always use underscores instead of spaces because some websites don't like spaces, including mine. So um, I rename everything. And it, trust me, a client doesn't like seeing you know, CR3201943. They'd rather have it be their kid's name, whatever it might be, or, or their wedding. Um, I will then do a batch resize. Once I've picked all the ones for my client, I do a select all resize to a small JPEG, and that's what goes on their gallery. So I upload all those um, to the client, and I'm done. Then I take orders. That's when I start editing. I don't edit until a client says, I want that picture either printed or in an album. And the reason is, again, efficiency. I don't want to edit a bunch of photos if no one's going to use them or order them. Okay. Um, I'll come back to questions in a minute. Hang, hold that one, though. Actually, I'll take a question right now. What the heck? We're going to switch over to Photoshop. So. I shoot everything raw. I shoot everything raw. I shoot everything raw for a couple of reasons. One is there's more data in a raw file. It's uh, you, so. I, it gives me the ability to play with it a little bit more and adjust it a little bit more. Um, and the other thing is, honestly, memory cards are so cheap and hard drives are so cheap, I don't mind burning a little extra space and having a raw file. And as I told the class this morning, the last thing I want to do is go somewhere amazing or shoot something amazing, and it's in JPEG, and I realized 
God, I wish I had more data. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the few shooters at the Olympics that shoots everything raw. So really? crazy but true, yeah. Most I shoot JPEG for speed. What type of gallery, gallery are you using? You are what kind of? You are saying you, are, you put your picture on a gallery. Oh, what kind of gallery am I using? So I use a service called Digilabs for my gallery. Um, I don't use them for albums and all that stuff, but just for the gallery. They're inexpensive, uh, they work well, um, they're local to me, which is good. There's lots of, you know, there's, there's Smug Mug and there's uh, Pictage, there's a whole bunch of different sites. Yeah, so the question is, am I going to focus on CS6 or CS5? Here's the thing, I'm, I'm in CS6, but most of what I show you is pertinent uh, within either Lightroom, to a certain extent, um, and CS5, some stuff even in CS4. I mean, I don't want to be too specific to CS6. There's a couple things in CS6 that are really nice um, that we'll look at. But uh, for the most part, again, whole, the whole idea for me is to keep it simple. Because honestly, I've seen people edit one photo for seven or eight hours, and it's beautiful. But that's a lot of time for one image. And it's really not realistic for th those of us who are trying to make money at it or do this as a hobby. We don't spend eight hours on one image. I mean, have I done it? Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Um, are most of the features available in Elements? I, uh, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've never used Elements, so I don't know. My guess is a lot of what I'm showing you is available in Elements as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold questions. I promise we'll get to them, though. Uh, and I want to jump into Photoshop here. Um, we're going live. So um, we're just going to kill Photoshop, uh, PowerPoint here. Should we play some music in the background? No. We'll get rid of that, too. All right. So. Um, Let's go into, we'll go in and um, let's find an image here. So you'll, oh, by the way, you'll notice, so I'm in Photo Mechanic right now. You, here's all the images that, uh, from a, a bar mitzvah that I shot. We're gonna kind of use some of these as, as samples here. Um, you'll notice that some are color coded uh, yellow and some are not. So um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna filter out and say, just show me those that are color coded, okay? And so what I want to do is we're going to start with an image like that one. I'm going to open Photoshop. By the way, notice an SSD, that's Photoshop opening. That's the difference between a hard drive and an SSD right there. So it's really, really fast. Okay. Um, let me just make this bigger so we can see it. So here's our image. Uh, and there's a couple things that I start with when editing. Anybody see anything wrong? With, this is a loaded question when I ask it. Anybody see anything wrong with this? Someone's going, yeah, it's crap. Um, <laughs> I have a really um, detailed eye. I, for those of us photographers, I don't know about you guys, I look at every image and see everything wrong with it. And I think that's a good thing, because someone once said to me, don't ever edit for your client. Always edit for yourself. So this, this is actually off. The horizon's off by, I'd say, about 2%. Now, not everybody cares about that. I can guarantee you my client is going to go, oh, that's off by 2%. We don't want it. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, it bugs me. So the first thing I'll do, now this one is not grotesquely off, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to come over here and grab this tool. And this is the straighten tool. And this is, again, th now we're inside of the raw processing, Adobe Camera Raw. So I want to straighten it. And all I have to do is just find anything that's straight. I can either go by this and drag across, OK? And, or, and straighten it. Or I could also go back and I can do a vertical or you know, come down here and say, gee, let's go by that as what's straight. It's about the same. <clears throat> now, big difference? It's arguable. But I'm really, really anal about my stuff. And I want, I'm always striving for perfection. Doesn't mean I get there. But the thing is, like I always tell my clients, my goal is always to over deliver. And, but at the same time, that doesn't mean over edit, because over edit means I'm spending three years on one photo. That doesn't work. And um, another photographer I know really well tends to over edit, and we have this discussion all the time. It's like, you know, you cannot spend five days editing an event. I know I can't, because I, I have another full time job. So I have little snippets in the evening to get it done. So, first thing is straighten it. Okay? Um, the other thing I'll do, so now that I've straightened it, I'm, I'm a little bit happier is I'm going to look at exposure. So one of the things I'll do is I'll test it with auto and say, how does that look? Sometimes auto works really, really well. And sometimes it's horrible. 
but it's kind of cool to see what does Photoshop think I should be doing. Doesn't mean I'll necessarily do it. In this case, it's not bad. It's actually a reasonably good fix. But I'm looking at this, I'm like, you know, that's good. You notice that the contrast is now up. And the things that I'm working on on a typical image, let me go back to default here, is I'm looking at exposure. So does that need to be brightened up a little bit? Yes. Do I want to add a little contrast? I do sometimes, you'll notice, I'll am sorry. i go extreme here so you can see the difference. OK? So I will add a little bit of contrast at times if I feel that it's needed. And one of the things whenever you have white like this is where's the detail? Am I losing the detail or do I have it in the folds? Do you see the difference? Let me go extreme again. Really bright, where I don't see any of the details. So let's, let's, let's pretend this is a wedding dress. I want to be able to maintain the detail in that. So I might, that's a little too dark. I might come to about right there. Yeah. Once you run the first test, can you do a batch of one? OK, so um, yeah, the question is, once I do this, can I batch process it? Like Programs like Lightroom, you can batch process. I don't. Uh, two reasons. One, it is not as easy to do inside of Adobe Camera Raw or Photoshop. But the other thing is, I do every image to taste. But again, the process I'm showing you here is so fast and easy, you can afford to do it. So it is true that for white balance, if I look at this particular image, I might say, this is a little too orange or you know, for me. I need to bring this down. So I'm going to go up to temperature. And I'm going to pull the temperature back a little bit to maybe 3,800. Okay, let me go extreme again and show you the difference. Really yellow, really blue, and maybe about where I want to be about maybe here, maybe 38, 3900. Once I know that, I know that I like 3900 as a Kelvin, I can just pop that in on every image if I want to. As I just type in 3900 on every image or just drag the slider to 3900. It only takes a couple seconds. Um, again, if, if I have hundreds of images that are all off and need to be adjusted, yes, I would probably batch process that in something like Lightroom. So, um, but generally when I'm shooting, that doesn't happen very often. Because if my white balance is going to be off on thousands of pictures, I'll try to correct it in camera first. Okay, so, um, so I'm adjusting the temperature, which is our white balance. Rarely do I ever adjust tint. For some reason at the Olympics in London, when I was shooting for USA water polo, the pool was weird. And all of us photographers at that pool were having trouble. And we had to adjust the white balance and pull the, the tint to more of a purple to get it to look right. But that's like seriously so rare that I ever touched that slider. So exposure is key. And I want to get the brightness correct for the face. So that's why I pulled that exposure a little brighter so that his face is nice and lit. But I pulled the highlights down to protect the whites. Okay, Shadows, I find that, at least with the Canon, with the 5D Mark II, 5D Mark III, even the 1DX, my blacks tend to be sometimes too black, to the point where the suit becomes like a big sheet of black as opposed to seeing the collar and the folds. So in this case, I'm, I could take the shadow slider and go up. So I want you, I'm going to just show you, look at the black in, in the, his uh, talit, hit the shawl, and I can go and adjust those, the shadow detail here. So this one here is OK. I might pull it up a little bit to show some of the detail. Okay. That, my friends, is most of what I'm doing in RAW is that. And I'll double check that. So shadows, highlights, exposure, white balance. Those are the main things. Now, in a different area, you have this third detail button, you'll notice I have sharpening defaulted to 67. When you shoot raw, the camera does not sharpen those images. When you shoot raw, you're telling the camera, don't do anything, let me do it. They're not sharp. If you shoot JPEG, the camera is artificially adding sharpening for you. So I default sharpening to around 67, 68, in that range. Okay, I don't have to adjust it every time because I've saved that preset, which I'll show you in a second how to do that. <clears throat> okay, now those are all kind of the main things I do. Let me show you how to save the settings. If I go back here for a second, let's. Um, if I were to go back to default here, okay, and I go back here, I want this 
67, everything else here is fine. I can come here and I can save those settings. Do you see the little drop down right here? So what I always do is I pre-save my settings for what I definitely wa want. What I definitely want is sharpening at around 68. Does that mean that every image is that way? Maybe not, but it's my starting point. And it, honestly, it works for 99% of the images. So I save that. Make sure you don't adjust tons of things and then save it, because if you adjust a bunch of other stuff, it's going to all be pre-saved that way. So start with your main area, this first button, kind of zero it out, probably, and then adjust that third button, sharpening, and then save. What about radius? I don't really mess with the radius at all. Um, don't need to. And here's the thing. Like I said, this doesn't work for everything, but it works for 90% of what I'm doing. Um, and frankly, there's 100 other things like radius that you could do, but do we need to do, right? So I'm trying to keep it really simple for myself um, to get this image done and out. And like I said, I use this for almost every image I shoot, regardless of what it is. So, um, the, so let's go to another one in the same slider here. At the bottom is luminance. How many people here are using luminance? That's it, huh? Did you save that unit? I haven't saved it. We're just gonna, I, I could. I could open it. And By the way, when you open an image in Photoshop, let me close that image in Photoshop. I'm not going to even save it. But guess what happens when I open it again? So what it does is it creates a, a sidecar file. That's what they call it. It's another file that holds the data of what what we just adjusted to that image. So unless, unless you delete that sidecar file, it stays, <clears throat> which is really handy because when you start doing some other stuff here in a minute with RAW, all of that stays, which is cool. All right, so let's open a different image. Um, we're going to go into, let's grab, let me see here. Uh, I want to find one that's kind of noisy. So let's do this one. This is handheld when he's walking with the Torah, so I've got the ISO cranked up to 3200 here. Um, so we're going to get some noise. If we zoom way in here, you'll see in his face that we have some noise. <clears throat> Oi! Good answer. Who said that? Um, so the luminance slider, which is again in that third button, is awesome. I used to run uh, other plugins for getting rid of noise, and there's a whole bunch of them. There's Nick Define and Noise Ninja and all these different programs, but those take forever. When you bring up a filter, you have to hit the button, it has to load the software, it has to go in, it has to calculate. I mean, you're talking like literally minutes of time. They've gotten luminance so good. Watch this. I'm just going to drag luminance to maybe about 28. I'm going to drag it back. Grain, maybe maybe even go higher. I mean, I can keep going. Look at the difference between 55 and that. <clears throat> so here, it's literally one slider. So people said, said to me in the earlier session, do you ever shoot more than ISO 3200? Sure. Because all I have to do is pull, now, granted, I pulled the luminance here to 48. I usually go to around 28. But you know what? If I were to zoom back out, which I will, I mean, this is going to look. This is the. This is one of those images that it's going to look great, even like this. And here's the thing: our clients, if you're shooting for a client, they're not that picky. I've never had a client say to me, "Oh, that one's too grainy. That one's too noisy." They don't know. Now, if you enlarge it to the size of someone's car, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> but honestly, I still do the luminance because I still want it. I need to edit every photo and retouch it, assuming they're going to want an enlargement, or assuming that a year from now or a month from now they want an enlargement. I don't have to re-edit it and fix it. So I always want to go with the best case. And the other thing is, it's one slider. It only takes me a couple seconds. I got this down. I could do this almost in my sleep. So um, you know, there's our image, nice and clean. It's going to print fine. And I hit open, and we're in. So that one Luna slider saves me probably on a noisy event, maybe an hour or two per event. That's huge. 
I love that. I mean, just that, that one trick. And someone showed it to me about a year ago and said, you should start using this, and it just changed everything for me. Um, the other thing <clears throat> is, how many people here have ever used the adjustment brush? A couple people. So let's, uh, let me find another image here. I marked a couple that we could go through. By the way, you see I shoot a lot. This is a real event. I changed names to protect the innocent. Isn't that funny? They actually did like, these uh, sumo wrestling things that cracked me up. OK. Here is a group shot. Well, guess what? I don't bring studio lights with me. Um, and you'll notice, what's wrong with this group shot? Dark, dark. dark in the back, at least to stop maybe more off, maybe two. Anything else? It's a little crooked. <laughs> off by about 2%. I, my brain is off by 2% always when I'm shooting. Um, so like I can come in here, uh, let's just straighten. And I might just kind of arbitrarily guess at this a little bit, a little better. Um, but what I'm going to do is I need to get these people brighter uh, and at least try to equal what I have here. So there's two ways to do this. The adjustment brush, which is this guy right here, I can go through and I could, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. Are you in raw or Photoshop? I am still in camera raw. We are not in Photoshop. By the way, one of the cool things about the Wacom tablet is I can uh, adjust the size of my um, brush here or, to, or by how hard I press, which is kind of cool. Um, so let's go ahead. I got a reasonable size brush here. Now, if I start brushing, I'm going to go, I'm going to raise the exposure here to like, like plus two and a half. And we'll start painting in. Ooh, that's really pretty, isn't it? Um, what it helps me do is at least see where my brush is. Now, we're not going to leave it that bright. But let's just kind of arbitrarily say we could do something like that. Now, let's bring it to what's more realistic. Whatever. Now, is it perfect? No, I'd have to paint in a little bit more. And watch this. I could do a new adjustment brush. And I could paint in more back here. OK, so now we have two brushes. Here's one. And here's one. I just put my cursor on it, and it highlights where I've adjusted it. Does everybody see that? We got that? <clears throat> so that's one way to do it. Let's delete these for a second. So I'm going to click on it and hit the delete key and get rid of them. <clears throat> the other thing you could do here to save time is do a graduated <clears throat> uh, filter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come here, and I'm going to grab that. Uh, and with the graduated filter, I can have that do whatever I want here. I generally hold down the shift key so it's perfectly straight. So shift key will keep it straight. So I'm going to come right down to about maybe here. And again, now I've got this graduated filter where I'm going back to front. So maybe about there. So we went from this to this. Make sense? So I use this quite a bit. This works really well on uh, landscapes if you have a sky that's a little too bright. <clears throat> Let's say you got uh, mountains and stuff in the foreground with a valley, and your sky was kind of like bland and uh, kind of a light blue. You could use this graduated filter, go in there, and actually darken everything in the sky. And it's really quick. It's literally just go to it, drag it down. And now we're working, once I open the image, we're, uh, we're working on it. This is our, our starting point in Photoshop. So it used to be that your only resolve was to bring a lot of flashes and set them up. Or and sometimes I'll actually shoot with multiple flashes, and I, I enlist the DJ and their dancers. OK, you're on this flash, and you're pointing this way. I'm on this flash, pointing this way. You, you're going to go straight toward the back. And now, honestly, I can shoot an image like this and uh, I'd still crop it, get rid of the lights, and do some other stuff to it to make it right. But you don't have to even worry about that. You can keep it simple. You can shoot it and correct it later. Yeah? These are the same tools that are in Lightroom. Yes, that's what I said. A lot of the same tools are in Lightroom. Yep, yeah. So this will transfer over. And how about Elements? I think Elements similar as well. Is there a reason you prefer this to Lightroom? Um, why do I prefer this to Lightroom? A um, couple things. Um, I've done it this way for a long time, and it's worked. That's why I prefer it. And that's the real answer. Um, but but I, there's some things I'm doing here that Lightroom either doesn't have. Because when I need to take it to the next step, Photoshop can take me to the next step. Lightroom is still, I think, limits me in places. 
like I said, there are times when Lightroom is nice because you can do global adjustments and things. I, I'm not a huge proponent of global adjustments because I want every image to be individually tweaked. And, and I think, again, if you're efficient like this, you can afford to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, can you use this for high-end photo shoots? Yeah, you can use this for a picture of your kid at a birthday party or for, I mean, honestly, everything I'm showing you here is what I use like if I'm doing a wedding or a portrait shot or the Olympics. It's it, honestly, it, I'm using the same tools, exposure. Like at the Olympics, you're not allowed to alter any photos. So I can do, I can do adjustments to exposure and contrast, but you're not allowed to clone or, you know, if someone's got your know, hair coming out, no, that's the way it is because they don't allow you to modify. But the same adjustments I'm showing you here, pretty much everything, straightening, cropping, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, all that is all the same, regardless of what the photo is. And this is, this is the 90% rule. These couple of features take me 90% away on 90% of my images. So you always go to, you always go to camera roll first? I almost go, always go to camera roll first from Photo Mechanic, just like I just did. I went to Photo Mechanic, I hit E for edit, launch as Photoshop, or Photoshop's usually already open. It comes up, I do the edits, and I'm done. And I can, I can edit typical image when I'm doing an event, I can go through and be done within two minutes, if not less. It depends. Depends how good I'm shooting that day. Garbage in, garbage out. But honestly, as I get better at shooting and exposure, I'll find like sometimes, which always amazes me, I don't have to do anything. It's dead on. Generally, sometimes I just want to pull things. The worst is when I do an album and it comes back and the blacks are too black or the contrast is wrong or the color balance is wrong. And that's why I say I want to do every image to, to its own. When I go to a class, and I still go to classes, I look for one or two tidbits that make me a better photographer or editor. That one, learning that luminance thing, it, it, like was like, you know, oh, you know the, everything opened up, the skies, and it was a beautiful day. When you use that tool, are you running the risk of softening the whole image? Sure. If you run that tool, are you softening the image? Yes, you are softening a little bit. There's two ways around that. You could layer a mask, the eyes and bring them back. Here's the thing, I find that the softening is so slight, it's worth it. Now, the one reason you don't want to overuse luminance is because you are you could over soften it. But for, for the most part, you, and you saw the image that we had there, even zoomed in, it looks pretty darn good. I'm gonna show you how to whiten teeth really easily. Um, I have a button on my tablet, so I use the bigger tablet on my home machine. This bottom button is get rid of yellow teeth. <laughs> <laughs> It's awesome. I just, it's funny because I've, I've been, I, so you'll notice my buttons uh, that are over here on the, right here. Have you guys, has everybody here turned their, uh, written a script or turned it into button mode? Oh yeah, oops. Okay, I'll add that to my list. 16, see we're up to 16. Um, I'm gonna show you how to do that. But what I do is I've always had this one, uh, actually you'll see at the bottom here, it's called white and teeth. Yeah. See, white and teeth. And then I finally realized I always had to kept hunting for it. So I wrote a script for it. Oh, do you I see like my make, make skinny? skinny oh, make skinny. We'll talk about that one. Okay, <laughs> stick around. I'll show you that one too. <laughs> these are my these are my, my actions that I just wrote. Yeah, they're, they're, I'll show you how to do them. They're easy. But so I realized that I was doing enough of this whitening of teeth that uh, it was a pain having to keep going to the button. So I just program. You can program the buttons on the tablet to whatever you want. So this is the um, uh, yellow teeth, make skinny, I forget what the other one is. And it's awesome, because like people are like, can you make me look better? <laughs> like, you know, uh. And here's the thing, the, the, the scary thing about this kind of retouching is with a client, you never want to say, I whitened your teeth, or I got rid of your zits. Um, I made you skinnier, um, I got rid of your wrinkles, um, you know, or, or worse. So. You, you, you want to avoid that. And, and honestly, good retouching is so good that they don't know you did it. And so, as I said earlier, it's like seasoning. If you, uh, I'll never forget, I, I did, uh, I don't cook. I'm a horrible cook. But um, one time I decided to make a recipe at home and it called for curry. I love curry. So I thought, okay, I'll put extra in. Some is good, more is better. Yeah, yeah. That didn't work. There's a reason I shoot and I don't cook. Um, it was awful. And so what I realized was retouching is a lot like the curry. Um, and you see the magazine with that skin smoothing software. They took the girl with the cute freckles and they ruined her and made her like this plasticine. Ugh. 
I mean, what the heck? I know they're trying to show a before and after to make you want to buy it. And I do use a skin smoothing program called Portraiture, um, and it works, but I always take it, I run it, and then I pull the op opacity of the layer to about, you know, depending, 60% or whatever. Because honestly, if someone has a mole, they have a mole. If someone has wrinkles, they earned them. Um, if someone's overweight, they're overweight and you know they eat like me. But that's the way, really that's the way it is. When I retouch, my Make Skinny, which I'll show you afterwards, remind me, is a 10% uh, squeeze in of an image. And it works. <laughs> no one knows it. Like I don't, like I, I've had some clients say, can you, make, can you run your Make Skinny feature on me? Because I mentioned it, sure. Most of them don't even know I did. They go, wow, I look really good. Yes, you do. <laughs> End of story. But it is cool to have them programmed on here, so I, I will show you that. Do you use any of the other luminance sliders? No, I don't use, I rarely use color luminance or any of the other luminance sliders. Don't need to. And again, it goes back to the 2,000 things I don't want to know. I need to keep it simple, move on, get it done. If it's right, and I, you know, people can differ, I think it's right, and it, it's worked well for me, so nope. Doesn't say always, but 90% of the time, I don't. I want, let me just tell you how to change your actions does anybody here know how to record an action? Uh-oh, okay, let's go backwards. Let me show you how to record, all right, I'll tell you what. We are gonna record our whitened teeth. Let me get rid of this. Just to protect those that we're editing, they all have white teeth, and this is nothing against them. That kind of thing. Uh, let's do, I don't know, how are, how are her teeth on this one? All right, we're gonna, we're gonna do it on this. So uh, we're gonna just leave this untouched. By the way, look at the suit. It's a little dark here. If I pull the shadows, do you see how I see the detail in the collar and the dress? This is why I pull that shadow slider. I, I don't know why, I just find that the camera tends to go a little too dark. So I pull it a little bit. Let's just do that. Okay, so now let's go into the image. By the way, first thing I do when I get an image like this, I hit the F key to go to full screen mode. Definitely do that. Because then you'll have that window around you, you have gray around it, it's much nicer. So I'm, uh, let me just tell you what I see wrong with this photo already. If I'm looking at this as just a photographer who's going through images, her hair, she's got flyaways, right? Let me head over here. So you see this? This, this has got to go. We're going to take care of that in a minute, I'm going to show you the easy way to do that. That, uh, I know that, let's take a look at uh, clothing. I see little dots, uh, specs there. Oop, there's another one right here. Look, ooh. Uh, is that on your center? Uh, no, that's just on his suit, because it's on every picture. I, I, you know. And that's the other thing, I become an expert on everybody's faces. Like when I'm done with Zach, I know, well he doesn't really have any zits, but when I'm done editing, I know every kid's every zit. <laughs> Um, and, you get, and you get good at it. After doing about the third or fourth picture, you're like, there, 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 and then you're done. Because you just know where they're gonna be. So let's go ahead, and, and, and Zach's got pretty good teeth here, but let's go ahead and whiten them. So normally what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use, I don't use the tragic wand, I use the quick selection tool, okay? And you'll notice the quick selection tool has a brush size in itself, which determines um, how selective it will be. So I'm gonna just make it about this size and come around across his teeth. Okay, I don't want his lips. If I hold down the option key, I can say don't do the lips. Pretty good. Now, here's, a, oops, let me get rid of this too. Here's the problem with this. If I adjust this, it's gonna be too obvious depending on his teeth and everything else. So what I wanna do is I want to Go to my selection, modify, so select, modify, feather. Notice how I put a short key, keyboard shortcut by it here. And, I, and here I typically feather around five or 10. I think here uh, it'll be 10. So I'm gonna feather by 10. What that means is the edges are not exact. The edges now are feathered so that it's not gonna be as obvious that we're messing with it. Now comes the fun. We are going to write a script for removing yellow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the button mode. 
this is what you're used to seeing. Okay, we're going to go to my set of scripts, and I'm going to record a new script called Yellow Two, Yellow Teeth Two. Okay, and you can you can give it a function key shortcut. You can change the color to, of course, yellow, um, and record. I am now recording. Okay, we are recording an action. When you buy actions, this is all they are. It's just someone who's recorded these things. So here, I'm selling you this for free. So now you're going to go to Image, Adjustments, Hue Saturation, or Command U. Got it? Okay. Now, we don't want Master. We want Yellow. And the first thing I love to do, and it just drives my family nuts, is I pull it the wrong way. How yellow are the teeth? <laughs> If Zach ever sees this video, I'm screwed. Um, but so there was more yellow in there than we assumed. So let's go back to where it was. Now watch what happens if I bring the saturation of yellow down. Ah. Okay. Now I want to stop my script. Stop. Guess what? We now have a yellow teeth two script. So what that means is, let's go ahead and get rid of this. Let's open the image back. Now what I can do, F to go to full screen mode. Whoops, I just highlighted his eye. Don't do that. All right, let's go to our highlight. We're going to highlight the teeth again. We're going to go and we're going to select and we're going to modify and feather. Now we could have just selected the teeth and we could have put the modify feather 10 as part of our action if we wanted. But now look, I can just hit let me go back to button mode. We can just go to our make our yellow teeth two. Boink. See the difference? So here's the cool thing about this is that with something even small like this, it's a you'll be amazed at how different an image will look. So let me just get rid of them that. Um, so if I go to the uh, before and after here, so here's our history. It's not really apparent. It's not really obvious here, um, but when you look closely, it is. Now, another trick that I use a lot, since we're off, we're jumping off my script. We'll go, now we're going to 17. But um, the other thing I love to do is I like to create a layer. Whoa! Um, let's see here. Here's my layers. So what a, one of the things you can do in Photoshop is you can do this. Uh, what's called a curved layer. Am I losing anybody? Are we good? good? All right. So I'm going to do a curve layer, and I'm going to brighten this. I'm really looking at his eyes. I'm not looking at the skin. I'm looking at his eyes. So I'm going to brighten, let's say, to about there. OK? But now the whole picture looks lucky. That's a technical word. So now I'm going to go, and I'm going to say, you know what? Fill that layer mask with black. So now my layer is invisible. I've just created a brightened layer that is now invisible because I created a layer mask and I filled it with black. Okay? The cool thing is now as long as I have white over here selected, I can use a brush. Let's make it smaller. And I can brush in uh, a brightening to the white, to the eyes. I can even whiten teeth if I wanted. That was a rough one. Uh, it looks a little too bright. Maybe the teeth. So then I can also go back and I can just say, you know, paint black back on top of those teeth. Let's let's not. Or gray. Or gray. Yes, actually, good point. You could also do gray. So one of the things I'll do when I talked about skin smoothing, I use the program called Portraiture, and it smooths out the skin. Here's the thing about skin smoothing: women love it. Men, when you make them look really smooth, we don't look very manly. We look uh, like we have, you know, I don't know, worked a day in our life. We, we, we're not meant to be that pretty. We're men. Ugh. So, um, so what I find is the women look great and the men just look too soft. So what I'll do is I will create a layer mask. I'll paint in the woman's skin at 100% or 80%. And, and so in other words, it's white on black or black on white. But if the, for the man, if I want it just half, I'll make it like gray, 50% gray, and then I can paint it in. It's a little bit more advanced. 
and it's more work than it's not part of my 90%. I, I'll be honest with you, this is a cool little trick to whiten teeth, but I do not want to whiten teeth on every image. So if it's a really close image, or God forbid if they have really yellow teeth, you may have to do that. But on a group shot, let's get rid of this photo for a second. If we go back to a, a larger group shot, um, you know, this one here, you know, I don't really care. If someone has really yellow teeth here, you're not going to see it, right? So don't waste your time. Unless your client says, and I've had this, please remove so-and-so. I had one grandmother who had just been through surgery. She had a, a, a bandage, a really large bandage on her arm, and I knocked it out of every image because it wasn't that hard to do with Photoshop, so I did it. But um, you know, they asked for it, and I helped out by doing that. All right, are we good? All right, question in the back. Well, if I raise the exposure level, I'm always looking for skin first. What you don't want to do is lose detail in skin or make them pasty just because you want their eyes brighter. One of the tricks that you see when we what shoot. That specific area, just like, or, you know, select the eye. Oh, you could select the eye and do it. I, one of the great things about creating a, a curved layer is that it's really easy and fast and you can paint it wherever you want. Yes, you could go in, you could do a selection of the eye, and I've done this, feather by 10, and then start raising the brightness. You could do that too. I find it easier to just create the layer and paint it in. Either way works. Again, I typically don't, the only time I'll whiten eyes, whiten teeth, sharpen eyes all individually is if I'm doing like a model and it's one shot that's gotta be perfect for the cover of something or whatever. I'll, I'll put every bit of detail into that. What if you have braces? What if you have braces? Yeah. Great question. If someone has braces, guess what? They have braces. <laughs> And I'll tell you why I say that. I have had family say to me, I wish we could have got Julia's braces off before her bat mitzvah. And you know what I tell them? Does Julia have braces when she's 13? Yes. That's who Julie is at 13, right? And this is the problem. Yes, can we remove them? Yeah, would you want to remove braces from every image? Hell no. No way, no. But the thing is, you have to reinforce the fact that, there, and here's the problem, our kids are bombarded with magazines that show mm -hmm. there's no reality, right? I mean, you can make someone skinnier, bigger, prettier, smoother, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I showed an image I could show you of a, um, a baby um, that I skin smoothed. And people like, you know, and I use this as an example of like, it doesn't have to be older people. The skin smoothing just got rid of the modeling of the skin. And the family loved it, you know? And so if you can skin smooth, I did it for my daughter as well. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, but it's who you are. And I, and I think we have to be really careful with um, the amount of tweaking that we're doing to people. And, and, and again, I think it, there's a, it's one thing to make someone a little bit better, but you, you want to make sure it's still them. And I tell grandparents this all the time, too. They go, can you get rid of my wrinkles? Oh, yeah, but I won't because you earned them. And the thing is, I'll lighten them. And like if you get the crow's marks or you get some, I can lighten them. And one of the things, if you have dark circles under the eyes, you guys, you guys know how to get rid of those? All right, let me show you. These people probably don't have dark circles. I'm going to find a young girl here who probably doesn't have dark circles. But... Did he? Yeah. All right, where are we going? Which one? In the temple? Wait, um... the outside one? Uh, where was that? Okay, let me find it. Hold on to it. Let's just filter out everything but red. So it was this one here? No, I'm sorry. Oh, so, oh, wait. Oh, on here? Okay. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, let's fix those. <laughs> you can tell I haven't edited these yet. All right, so let's go ahead and fix them. So the way I would fix this is um, the clone tool. Now, the clone tool is one of them that's on my list. So uh, clone stamp, S for clone stamp. So what I want to do is I want to clone out the dark circles. So what you want to do for cloning, one of the easy ways to get rid of this, is I'll go to clone and up at the top of mode, I go to lighten, and I'll change the opacity. By the way, you don't have to change the opacity number here. If you go to the left of it, you can actually, believe it or not, move your mouse left or right and adjust the number. 
That's true on any of these, even here, you can, everything's suggestible by just going to the word almost and, and moving left or right. So I'm at 29% opacity right now. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna clone from right here, okay? See the difference? I'm at 29%, I can go again. Now I'll be around 50%. Yeah, that looks good. And I'll clone from right here. And I'll do this one. Just paint it in. There we go. What's that? Where did I take it from? Yeah. Right below the eye. So I'll, I'll generally try to find the same kind of skin color. So here, I'll, I'll take it from about, for this one here, I can take it from right about here. And because it's in lighten mode, it's only going to lighten the darker area. So it knows better. So you don't have to worry about it over lightening you know, the, the part that is already light, if you will. Yeah. Well, okay, one of the first things that is on my list for Photoshop is to create what's called a duplicate layer. So I'll be honest with you, we teach people to create a duplicate layer first so you're non-destructive, you're not messing with your image. I don't do it most of the time. You know why? Um, I've done this enough, I can get it close, and if I screw up, I can always go back, because you always have your history, um, and you can always go back and get rid of it. So let me, uh, where's my history? Ah. History. So if I don't like that, what we just did, I can go back. There's our before and after. And I can just say, you know what, get rid of everything from here on. And I can just throw them in the trash. That's in your history right here. But again, you know what? If I don't like it the first time I do it, I, I do an undo right away. So yeah, they say duplicate your layer and do all your adjustments on the duplicate layer. There are times when I do it. Um, and when I do the teeth whitening, there's times I do a, a separate layer first. But um, it also doubles the size of your file. Or if you have like 10 layers, it's 10 times the size of your file. I mean, I've got one file that's like over a gigabyte just in one picture. That's the way the exception, not the norm. When you're using the tablet, do you still have to use the option key and also when you click? Yeah, but no, the tablet, uh, do you have to use the option key? The cool about the tablet is on, on the pen itself is a little button right here. So the button here can be my mouse button, and I actually have two buttons on it. So I can actually do a right mouse click right from the, from the stylus. Um, so this is, it's funny, the tablet was life-changing to me. It's probably the one piece of hardware that, like I hate editing without it. And I actually do travel with, with it quite a bit because if I know I'm gonna be editing a fair amount, if I know I'm shooting like a little bit and going home, I won't bring it. But if I know I'm gonna be editing a lot, I love this thing. It is. Uh, for a couple hundred bucks, an amazing time saver. It's awesome. Um, this is the Intuos 5 Touch Small. They have small, medium, and large. I'll be honest with you, this thing has, actually has touch mode, so I can turn it on. This is on or off for touch. So if it's on, you can do things like you can rotate, you can zoom in, you can do all stuff. I hate it. You know what I find? I find that it picks up my, mount, my hand on the tablet and it starts doing stuff I don't want it to do. So I'm generally defaulting to touch off. Um, all right, so where are we? We, um, oh, so it's so funny. The next thing on my list was duplicate layer. Um, I owe you five bucks. Okay, so let me, uh, let's kill this for a second. Um, we can do it on any photo. Let's just take the family photo here. Uh, actually, let's not. Let's go back to, where is her hair? This one. Okay, so. We, we're going to open up the, uh, this image because I told you that she had her, her flyaways. And one of the things that Photoshop has, this I think started in CS5, is the um, spot healing brush. It's J on the keyboard. And before I knew it was called the spot healing brush, I just knew it was J on the keyboard. And I would tell all my friends, J, J just, and they go, well, how do you fix J? How do you fix that J? Like, it's the coolest thing ever. It doesn't stand for Jeff, but it's the coolest thing ever. Um, and what it is is, you'll see here when I hit J, that it is the uh, spot healing brush, the top one there. And the cool thing about it is, let me make my brush a little bigger and let's zoom in a little bit here so we can see what we're doing. Okay, the cool thing about this is now I have a tablet. So I told you if I press lightly, you'll notice that it's very thin. But if I press hard, it's very thick. So again, I'm not sitting there adjusting brush sizes because I have a tablet. So I can go in here and I'll just press a little bit harder, about like that, and that's good. And then I can just say, oh, this one bugs me too, and that one. But do you see how it's, it's, it's automatically working with the gradations in the background? 
Let watch this through his hair. Woohoo! Watch this. Uh, same thing with like little uh, skin imperfections. Oops, that was a dot on my monitor. I just got rid of. Um, <laughs> like here, up, oh, a little flash reflection. Uh, knock that out. Sometimes you get the little reflections in the teeth. I'm pressing really lightly on the tablet. I can get rid of that if I wanted to. Remember that little mark? Right there? Gone. Now the cool thing is, if I want to get rid of something on the, on the tie, notice how I put it back? It's looking at the pattern. So if I have a, a, something uh, really nasty on his tie, let's put something nasty on his tie. We have a big spot right there, right? I can use this tool and it looks at the pattern of the tie, and it just filled that in. Yeah. Major, uh, you know, uh, shiny spots, like major shiny spots are do, tough. Do you um, use a particular program? Yeah, so no, for major shiny, and it's weird. Some people that you photograph have very shiny skin, very oily yeah. skin. And you get this massive shine. Not that David has that. Um, I had to throw one at him as he left. But, um, you know, and that's tough because if it's all over, then you have almost nowhere to try to clone or get real skin color from. Um, and there are times when you just deal with it. Um, and, you, and if they ask, then you just say, your husband's shiny. <laughs> but I try to fix it as best I can. This feature though, the fact that it, like I've even cloned stuff across things. So like, let's say something was here, I can clone across the tie into the suit. Let's see how it does. Relatively decent. It knew where the suit ended and the tie started. This is amazing. I can go through a park bench into the grass and it'll figure it out. Now, the one thing about the, um, this technology, this adaptive healing is what they call it, is it's not always perfect. So there are times when you are working and it'll put stuff there where it's not supposed to be. Like it'll think, oh, you want more hair? And you're like, no, I don't. But if you try it again, it's a random thing, it'll work. So I'm gonna just try it. Let's see if we can get this one hair that's kind of bugging me right there. This freaks people out. Uh, because if you think about it, if you were to try to clone that, it'd be really hard. So to me, when they came out with this ability in CS5, this was like, to me, worth every bit of an upgrade price for one feature. Because it is, I mean, seriously, I use this for like, I'm looking at this, this one right here, this is bugging me. Sometimes I won't do the whole strand, I'll just do little pieces at a time to make sure that I'm okay here. And I'm looking at this going, eh, let's see if we can fix it a little bit. I'll just keep going. And if it doesn't work, I'll go to the clone tool and I'll just clone it myself. But 90% of the time, this is a lifesaver. And this is why I tell people, J, just use the J tool. I mean, like here's another one, right here, right across the skin, the piece of hair, gone. And look how it averaged the darker part of her skin, the lighter part of her skin. It is awesome. So one tool, J, that's all you have to remember, and that's adaptive healing brush. Now the one trick to that is if you change this menu from the spot healing brush to, let's say, get rid of red eye tool, now every time you hit J, it'll go to the red eye tool. So remember to go back and change this to the first option, and then it'll keep going back to the spot healing brush. And we could go in there and just clean up any little imperfections I mean, she doesn't have a whole lot of imperfections, so we're good. But we can, you know, just, you know, little stuff to big stuff. I mean, here's more stuff over here, I, I, and I'm pushing harder on the pen to get a little bit bigger stylist. Trying to do this, especially on a gradated sky with a clone tool, is almost impossible. When there are a number of tools in one place like that, is there any way to make one of them the default? Yeah, it's whatever the last one is. You, whatever the last tool is that you used is the default. So I typically live in this particular spot healing brush and never leave. I rarely ever have red eye in anything because I'm shooting with a second flash, you know, a boot flash and stuff. Rarely, um, but I get in and out of that tool if I need to and I'm right back to this tool. Spot healing brush to me is seriously is like, um, you know, as life changing as the tablet or, I mean, there's certain things that just really make life easy. Well, correct, okay, so that's a good point. Spot healing brush has been around. The difference is this, this um, the technology for this adaptive healing. So for instance, let's say for instance, it's content aware fill. So I'm a, we're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna make this go to white. So if this is a, um, 
a imperfection because there's a white wall there. With, with content aware fill, I can come in here, I can highlight this area and I can say fill. And it says, how do you want to fill it with white? No, I want to fill it with content aware. And what it does is it figures out, oh, do you want green background? And it starts, look at that. That's fake. So when you're doing panoramas and you end up with a really cool panorama, but you got a bunch of white at the top or black and it's, all you have to do is just do that same thing. You fill it and just say, fill with content aware. And it goes, oh, sky, clouds, and it's crazy. So what I'm going to do now is we have a black spot now. We're changing it up. First it was white, then it's black. OK, so uh, I use my marquee tool right here. And I'm just going to like you know, highlight the area. I go to fill and say con uh, use content aware. And it will figure it out. Um, you know, and if it doesn't work, no, delete only works if you're on the base layer. And a lot of times you're not on the base layer. Don't, uh, you can use delete. But you can also use fill. The problem with delete is if you're not in the base layer, it'll confuse you. Oh, okay. So the cool thing about this, and um, we could probably go, hold on, we're going we're gonna, to, how are we doing for time here? We're doing good. OK. Now, well, I can't find anything. I'm trying to, I mean, because you could, like, I mean, here, we, like, we could even, so here, with the sky on this shot, if I were to, like, say, get rid of this plane, this would be really interesting. Like, what's it going to do? I'll hit the delete key, because you can't do that on the base layer. Oh, it put a new plane in. Look, <laughs> you see what it did? It took the plane, plane number five, and moved it up. And and it is pretty close to in the pattern. That's. <laughs> Why did it take five and three? Three was closer. That's a good question. Why did it take five and not three? I have no idea. I'm not the programmer. I don't know. Like, but it is pretty incredible. So Why what? Um, it, so it's, fi it's figuring, it's seeing the pattern of those planes. Yeah. If it was just sky, and, and believe me, this does work because um, when you have an image that has a lot of st stuff in the sky, um, let's see if I can find something that, um, I mean, I'll even use it like for here, this is Mexico City. So um, this shot here, let me get rid of some of this. So like here, if I say, gee, I want to get rid of, uh, you know, like these, this cloud, or these clouds, or whatever, and it, it'll, it'll probably there. Yeah, so it'll give me a different averaging of what the, it thinks should be in that sky. But let me tell you something: when you have a gradation of sky and there's an airplane trail you don't want there, it, 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 trying to clone gradation is brutal. It, this, seriously, this thing works amazing. Now, it doesn't work all the time. I've done one. There was a guy painting in, in Central Park on a couple trips ago when I was here, and I tried to do it, and you know, I put like an ch extra chair leg and part of a leg sticking out or whatever, so it doesn't always work. But I'll tell you, if it gets you three quarters of the way there and you do the rest, it's pretty cool. Does it so. work on wires on the floor? Oh yeah, well wires on the floor I'll do with, the, uh, with J, the adaptive healing brush, and go right across the wire, and I do that all the time. Um, so for instance, one of the things I've noticed in a lot of the um, temples, let's go back to our other, our mitzvah here, um, you'll see that we have wires and stuff that, uh, here's a good example. If I wanted to, we're not going to adjust this, we're just going to go straight into it here. So let's go in and say that I want to get rid of this, uh, this wire that the DJ, uh, actually this is the video guy conveniently wired up right in our way here. So if I want to get rid of this, I can just travel right across it like this. And um, again, most of the time, even though I'm across those two, see how it worked? Now you can see a little bit. I'm seeing a little bit here. You can keep working it a little bit if you want. Fact of the matter is, again, uh, so I'm seeing a little bit in here. I don't like to see patterns. It bugs me. But there. I mean, you could do, I mean, honestly, you can clone out huge stuff. Let me make the brush a little bigger. Let's get rid of the microphone. Now I'm doing all one sweep there. That may or may not work. Yeah, not bad. And this is why the Olympics don't allow editing. Because honestly, you can take a, an image of you know, Apollo Ono as he's cruising around on the short track speed skating, and he's got his hand on a guy, and you could remove, I mean, you know, <laughs> seriously. I had a picture in Vancouver Olympics. It was a great shot of a slap shot, and right in the end of the, is this guy's skate sticking right through my frame. Normally, I just go through and say adaptive healing, get rid of it, because it'll just go ice and throw it in. Um, and I couldn't clone, I mean, I'm sorry, I couldn't crop, which you, you're allowed to crop, but his, his leg was in the frame right by the stick. 
So I can, normally we get rid of it, but you're not allowed to. And the reason is you're, you're altering reality. Look, now there's no microphone. Of course, we have part of a microphone, but we can get rid of that too. <laughs> now what you don't want to do, by the way, is you don't want to cross over into a, a white area on the edge of a frame. There it actually worked very well. When you go into the edge of a frame sometimes, it'll do some weird averaging. Yeah, it's doing pretty good today. Um, but seriously, that tool uh, is one of those ones that, uh, if, you, if you remember nothing else, remember that one. So um, we talked about duplicating a layer. Let's, t uh, let's go back to this image for a second. Hello? Uh, sure, we'll use that one or this one. OK, so um, we're just going to open this one. We're not going to adjust it. We're just going to let it be. So now, um, what I, what, it is true that when you, if you're going to do a lot of work to an image, you want to duplicate the layer first. And it's really easy, because that's actually another J. It's just Command J. So Command J, now I have two layers. So on this layer, let's, get, let's say we're going to really alter reality. This will be weird, because it probably won't work. But we're going to get rid of the Torah. That's sacrilege, by the way. Um, See, now there it didn't work. We got her dress and we got all kinds of weird stuff. So Photoshop goes, I don't think so. Um, let's, get, let's go back. Let's, uh, see, it knew it was sacrilege. Let's get rid of the uh, <laughs> microphone on his face. And uh, you know, uh, get rid of her, let's get rid of his eyes. I don't know. <laughs> So now what we have is we have a, that's really rude. Um, so, so we have this layer. So this is our, our layer. So we can turn it on or off. And um, so the cool thing about having that, that layer is that if I do make major modifications, I can come back because I can either paint it out. I still have the base layer there. And there's, you still have your original image. So like if I say, like, and I have this sometimes when people say, can you get rid of, um, Let's turn this back on. Yo, can you get rid of these words? Because you know, there's something in there that I didn't want you know, grandma to see. I don't know, we're making this up. So now the words are gone just by using that J tool. They're gone. And I can turn it off and on, right? <laughs> but it's totally non-destructive. So I can't <laughs> get his eyes back because it's freaking me out. Um, <laughs> but it's that easy. So if you create the other layer, it's a protective ability. And I will, if I look at an image, uh, and a lot of times, here's what I do, and I've talked about this in my event photography uh, class I did here. My favorite thing to do is when I shoot an event in the morning and they have an evening party, is I like to take my favorite image of the family, I get home and I edit the heck out of it. And I do all the things we're doing here. I adjust it, I skin smooth it to taste, I crop it, I, I, if there's a tree coming out of someone's head, I clone that out or, or use the J tool and get everything right. And then I print it on um, velvet fine art paper and frame it. And then I bring it to them in the evening, which cost me about $28 for the frame and 5 bucks for paper and ink. That $30 makes me more referrals than you've ever seen in your life. So great thing to do, by the way. The cool thing is that image, I'm doing a lot of work to that one image. So that one, I will duplicate the layer and get rid of all the flyaway hairs, white and teeth, get it perfect, because I want that one to be really good, and frame it. But that's the one. I will create a separate layer. So I always have the base layer to go back to if I don't like something. OK? What size? What size do I print? Uh, I, get the, I go to uh, Michael's. Do you see it? Michael's here, right? Or whatever. Yeah. I go there. Well, they have their half-off frame sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they know us. <laughs> they have the half off frame sale, and we walk in and go, uh, 20? And they we don't have 20. Well, order us 20. So we get like these gross cases of them for, I think they're like normally $52, and we get them for 26 or something like that. And, and we buy 20 at a time. And, um, and then the, it's a, let me get this right, 16 by 20 frame with a 11 by 14 inset with a mat. It's a really nice frame. And uh, so I print 11 by 14s on my printer on the Velvet Fine Art. Really looks beautiful. It takes me 10 minutes to frame, or my wife 10 minutes to frame if I'm, I'm running. Uh, and then, you know, but when you bring that to a client, I mean, it blo first of all, it's not just a client, client that gets blown away. I bring a little stand to put it on. Aww. They don't get to keep the stand. My wife will kill me because she bought that little stand for me. But what do they do when they get to the party? Every guest who comes in goes, is that from today? Yeah. And then they come up to me like, that's amazing. That's just a beautiful photo. That, like, but what, but what is it, right? It's potential clients. 
especially when you're doing a bar mitzvah, because who you're surrounded by? A bunch of the Jewish people who have kids the same age, right? <laughs> so so it's, it's all marketing, mm -hmm. but, but, but it's also an amazing gift. It's a win, 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 all the way around. Um, and so for those, I will edit them a little bit more, because I want it to be, I want perfection. I want to get as good as I can for that shot. Yeah? Can you uh, put the eye inside that layer and the other there? Can I do what inside the layer? Put the eye inside. Can I put the eyes back in? Let's yes. Sure. Okay. So the question is, can we can we take parts of the layer? So we, we played with his eyes, and we also took out the writing down here, right? Okay. So I just want the eyes back in because this is a, a layer. A layer, I can create what's called a layer mask. That's this guy right here. Okay. Now the layer mask means that um, it's either going to be exposed or not. So right now it's all white, which means the layer exists. If I fill the layer mask with black. It now does not exist. Okay? So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna leave it white for a second. What I'm gonna do is because it's a white layer mask, if I paint black, here's black, if I just use my brush and paint black, it brings it back. So black exposes. Do you see? Well, I don't know if you can see it. All right, hold on here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit more work to this image. We're gonna black out this whole area. And you'll see it show up. Do you see a little black speck? I've exposed it. Basically, it's like as if you had taken a layer, put it on top of your image, and then you use an X-Acto knife, and you cut through that layer so you see what's behind it. So all I'm doing is I'm painting the opposite color all over this layer now, and it'll show up. So if we zoom way out, this will be easier. Let me just paint all over, and you'll see it. Is that just taking back the original photo? It's taking it back to the layer that's underneath it, which is the background layer, which is untouched. So if I wanted, someone had mentioned earlier about gray. So black is cutting it with our X-Acto knife through the layer. If I change this to, a, to instead of black, I change it to like 50% gray. Now he will end up with half eyes, which would be interesting. And there you go. Because now it's like we used kind of an X-Acto knife, but only half of it. Well, you were still seeing through some of it. Yeah, so like you will have images. Like many times, if I was to tweak his teeth here, um, or what, you know, let's say I'm gonna modify something on her, in her hair, I will. If I select that area and hit Command J again, you'll end up with another layer. And this layer is just. Let me turn off the other layers. Is just that. So. In the case of our teeth whitening, one of the things that we could have done is created a layer for the teeth and whitened them. Mm -hmm. But frankly, it takes more time, and it's, I don't think it's that necessary in that case, but we could have. We could have done that. If you're going to do massive editing to a photo, it's good to work on layers. Again, every time you duplicate a layer, in this case, it's not duplicating that much data. It's probably one-tenth of the image or one-twentieth. But if you duplicate the whole thing, it's going to be a lot. Are we getting off topic or are we good? All right, question. So, so um, I was actually just going back to the picture and you just took it out. I just quickly wanted to ask you what kind of printer do you use for that? And when you said you made all these adjustments to get the image perfect, I was wondering if you could just summarize those adjustments that you made. Um, almost all the adjustments that I make for that image is exactly what we're showing here. It's the 90% rule. Seriously, it's exposure, it's uh, shadows, it's highlights, it's cloning, it's the J tool. Uh, I might adjust the contrast a little bit, and that's it. I mean, everything that we've talked about, and that's pretty much it. And, uh, and printed, and other than the skin smoothing. So let me, um, so a, a printer I use is the Epson R2000. It's like 500 and something bucks. And uh, it's great. That's so what, less portable. It goes to 13 by 19, I think, is the largest size it does, which is the paper I use. I just use 11 by 14 of it. I have a question. Yep. Um, all the adjustments that you made in camera raw, um, they're not destructive because? So all the adjustments I made in Camera Raw are non-destructive because, because it's a sidecar file. So all it's really doing is it's, it's just keeping a very tiny little file that says, by the way, you pulled this this way, you pulled that way, you pulled this way, and you did uh, something here. It remembers that. And where is that? That's stored as, uh, about to, I'll show you. Um, the actual file is stored as a sidecar. Let me show you. So here is, uh, let me go to Photos. Zach's bar mitzvah. So here is an XMP sidecar file. So look at the size of it. It's 8K, 
which means it's almost nothing. It's a 27 megabyte file, and 8K tells ACR how much I modified that thing. It's incredible how much data being stored in that little bit of code. This is just very basic, but if you wanted to send that image 90 to someone in the raw, would you have to highlight I don't send things in the raw because I wear clothes when I'm editing. Uh. <laughs> would, you, would you have to add the XMP and send them both? Yes, if I wanted to send someone the raw file with my modifications, I would just send them the raw file, this one here, 90 and 90 XMP. That little 8K file makes, now, there are times I look at an image and think, oh, I don't really like the way I edited it. So I just take that little XMP file and trash it, and guess what? It goes right back to what I had. I mean, to vanilla, raw, so untouched. you open 90, or you open XMP? You open 90, no, you open 90, not the XMP. It automatically will drag, it'll drag the sidecar file with it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let me show a couple more things here, although we've, we've, we've got a lot of them. So the clone tool um, that, we, that we worked on a minute ago, um, there are times when the J tool doesn't work. Um, so, uh, whoops, let me go back here. Ah. All right. So if, there are times when I want to clone things uh, versus where the J tool doesn't work. And what I'll do is I'll just use the um, stamp S for stamp. And just so you know, it's this one right here. It's also the top one, clone stamp. And really all you're doing, and, and again, this is fairly basic stuff, but all I'm doing is just hitting option, click anywhere, and then just using it to, to knock it. Oops. Okay, why didn't that work? Do you know why it didn't work? Because I'm still in lighten mode. So I need to go back to normal and go 100% opacity. Now it'll clone out. So the clone tool, very basic tool, but I do use it um, for cloning out things where the other tool doesn't work. Um, and generally what I'll try to do is use the clone source somewhere near where, like for instance, in, this, in the case of this hair, um, let's take this one right here. Um, if I didn't, if the J, J tool wasn't working, I would use the stamp tool mm -hmm. and just grab from up above. But here's the problem, look what happens. Yeah. See how it's, it's kind of obvious right there? Yeah. Well, especially if you screw up like that. But I mean, what I'd probably do is come in here and make it really small and try to get as close to it as possible. Painted in, you can still see, but it, you get the idea. You you can, you know, clone from up here a little bit. That's too dark. This is why this is why the J tool is so amazing, because I mean, it, it does all that for you. Would you use the J tool to get rid of the bags under his eyes then? Like a little Here's the problem: if I do the J tool for the bags under the eyes, it's going to probably be too extreme, and it'll probably uh, be really obvious. Let's go do it. Let's do it. Never tried it. Let's try it. My guess is it's gonna it's gonna try too hard to get rid of it, and we're gonna end up with a really fake looking, but we'll find out. So J, it's not bad. It's a little too much. Uh, if I created a separate layer first, I could. Yeah, you could. Whoops. I mean, you could. It's a little. I, you know, here's the thing though. With, with, the reason I do the stamp in twenty percent or. 30% is because I can paint it in. This is, this is like saying, okay, go away and never come back. And I don't really want to do that because you had a little bit of the dark under the eyes is realistic. You have to be careful that you don't get so caught up in it that, that it's like, well, wait a second, isn't there a light above him? Like, why is there no shadow, right? I mean, so you want to be careful with that. All right, so uh, a couple of things. So the cloning tool is simple. Uh, it's also fun. My kids love it when we put the, the third eye on people and, and, and you know extra teeth or you know whatever on them. Um, but it's a fun tool. Um, the cropping tool is, again, simple but incredibly helpful. Um, so cropping, I never crop inside a raw, I'm almost, I shouldn't say never, almost never. I almost always crop inside uh, uh, Photoshop itself. And really what I'm trying to do is just kind of work within what I think would be the best image. With cropping, I generally work within what's unconstrained, but I have a trick, and you'll see that I, you'll notice I got five by seven, 16 by nine, eight by 10, or eight by 11, or whatever. At home, I have five by seven, four by six, 11 by 14. So I do, when I go to do 11 by 14 crop um, for those prints, it's already pre-done for me. So all I have to do is say, give me a five by seven. Now it's five by seven, or flip it around so it's that way, and I can move it around. So for cropping, one of the things I do is when someone orders a photo, I never crop the photo and save it. 
What I do is I retouch it. Let's pretend that we've retouched this image. OK, and it's done. I save it. Then when I go to print, I now go to C for crop. Probably do it this way. Um, it's, it's constrained right now to 5x7, because that's what they want to order. We're pretending. And so we're going to say, yep, that looks good there. Now I print, and then I close it without saving it. Why do I do that? Well, here's the problem. What if someone calls me three days later and go, oh, I love that image. Can you do it 4x6? Whoops. Now I'm going to crop to 5x7, but now I'm missing stuff that I need for a, large, for a different mm -hmm. crop. So I always save the original file, crop, print, crop, print, crop, print, but I don't save. Just the first edit is saved. And that way, you can use it for whatever size anybody orders. It's just a good time saving. OK, so we showed teeth whitening, which was next on my list. Layer mask we showed, and actions we just did. So we're actually jamming ahead here, so we're looking good. So um, th that is, so those are the base 15 right there. So actually, we have, we're probably pretty close to 15. The, the thing to keep in mind, I'll get to your question in a second. The thing to, um, to keep in mind is, in Adobe Camera Raw is where you're doing your base adjustments for your, your um, and someone asked about saturation earlier. I should show you that, too. Um, let's go, uh, let me see. I don't know if I have any raw files. Uh, let's see what we got here. Why is it better to do this in Camera Raw than in Photoshop? Um, the reason I like to do it in Camera Raw is because uh, Camera Raw is A, non-destructive, and, and there's way more data inside of uh, the raw file, so I prefer to do it there. But I only do the adjustment, the, the global adjustments to, to brightness and all that in Camera Raw. So I'm trying to see if I have any, um, this China trip, let me see if I have any uh, raw files in here to play with. I usually get rid of raw because I got too many of them. All right. Um, well, all right, let me just find a, we'll just go to our standard. <clears throat> we'll go here. Let's see if we have any good blue sky shots here. Yeah, we're going to take a look here. I got some outside stuff here. But of course, not just for blue sky. You can use it for anything. Oh, what the heck? Let's just take her cute little dress. So one of the great things about Photoshop, or sorry, Photo Mechanic, is I just hit E for edit, and it pops up Photoshop for me or Adobe Camera Raw. So again, off by two percent because I tend to tilt myself like that. I don't know why. Look a little better uh, now. So. Someone in the last class asked me if I tend to uh, bump the colors. And you can tell here by this image, I don't really need to. There's two sliders I will play with if needed, generally not for portraits. Generally, this tends to be more for landscapes um, or areas where I can play with color without affecting skin tone. So saturation, if I pull it, it looks really, I mean, this would sell as a postcard tomorrow, but it's not realistic. So you can desaturate. But I'm, let's say I want to go maybe plus five or six. But you know what? I'm going to bring it to zero for now. And uh, let's, um, whoops, zero. And let's pull the vibrance. What vibrance does is vibrance pulls the colors, but does not mess with skin tone. So in the case of a portrait like this, and I want to make her dress a little bit brighter, or the green behind her a little bit brighter, but I don't want to mess with her skin tone, I will use vibrance. Now, I'm at plus 26. That's a bit much. Typically, I'll just pull it a little bit, maybe you know 10 or 12. Uh, but we'll, but the, the thing is, when you start playing with hue saturation and the saturation levels on skin, you can make people look really nasty. Um, the other thing I will tell you is if you ever try to sell stock photography, they have an algorithm that looks for oversaturated images. And you try to post one to sell for stock, and it will get declined and say, you've oversaturated your image, which is kind of interesting. So they can tell that. Um, here's another thing you should know. When you, um, you know that. Do you guys know what metadata is? Mm -hmm. So when you take a picture with your camera, it stores a lot of data in that file. What camera you use, what lens you used, what settings you used. So the cool thing is you can see that metadata um, in your image right here, f3.5, 80th of a second, ISO 160. I used my 70 to 200 to 8. Um, and I was at 200 millimeters. It tells me all that. Those same settings are also saved. Um, in other respects, like when I download images, I save my own metadata, which is photographed by Jeff Cable, Jeff Cable Photography, copyright 2013, blah, 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 blah. All that gets saved. Um, but they can also tell if it's been modified inside of Photoshop. 
So, um, and there are forensic tools that can actually look at your file and tell you where, you, where you've cloned or used that JTool. Um, actually, the forensic tools don't use the EXIF information. The forensic tools are comparing bits and saying, wait a second, these are the exact same ones over here. It's pretty amazing. Um, so now, I, now, no mother or father from a mitzvah or of the bride is going to go, forensically. Um, but again, I, I think we, you know, we, going back to trying to keep it true and, 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 and realistic is kind of what I try to aim for. I mean, there's times when you could you know, boost saturation in eyes and things. But I rarely do it. And you know, honestly, if you take a decent photo, it should in itself be good. And you know, like when people said, do you boost the colors? I don't need to boost the colors most of the time. There are times when we do, but most of the time we don't have to. Sure. Yeah, pick up your mind, Jeff. Getting back to fill, can you do that if you increase the canvas size of a picture? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, if they said to me, um, if they say, actually, let's use that image. If they say they, they want, you know, let's say I need to print this and I need more green on top. There's numerous ways to add it, but you can actually, so one of the things I do is I'll use the crop tool. Now uh, let's go unconstrained crop, hold on here. Uh -huh -huh. All right, crop. And then when you crop, a lot of people don't know that you can actually take the crop tool and you can add. So let's say that we want more like that. So now that is the size of our canvas. And then you can use your marquee tool. This will be interesting. I don't know if this will work, but we'll try it. So um, now I'm going to try that, and I'll fill with um, content aware. This may or may not work. We'll find out. Yeah, we might end up with part. We may, yeah. You got to do it in several steps. So yeah, we're, 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 trying to, we're trying to cheat, see if we push the limits a little bit. But, but the, uh, the other thing you could do is, you, the one of the things I've done in the past, I've taken the green strip from the edge here and I've cloned it to this side so it has two yeah, sides yeah. to look at. Yeah, yeah. And then it works better because it sees green on both sides. We'll just see what happens here. We'll probably end up with her and her evil twin, but we'll see. <laughs> one of the fun things about Content Aware is you just never know what you're going to get. <laughs> that is not, well, it's now. Yeah, we can use the brush and we can do this. The problem is you'll see that we end up with. Yeah, I mean, that one's kind of obvious. Did you guys ever see the, um, the guy that took the picture of the Gulf War and he added all the smoke? He got fired from, I, I think it was, in, it was one of the, I think it was New York, right? it was one of the papers, but it was a major image of the bombing in Afghanistan or Iraq, or wherever it was, and the guy, did, there wasn't enough explosion and smoke, so he cloned in more. <laughs> Go figure. Um, but it was obvious, because it was the same puff, like. <laughs> So yeah, like one of the things I would do if this is my if this was my starting point. Now what I do is I go into the J tool. Oops. Let's just see what happens. I mean, it's a starting point. This you know I, w I wouldn't be okay with this, but you know, it's it's going to keep trying that same thing I think. But we could we'd be able to work with it and try to figure it out. And what I'd probably do is clone some other green area. The other thing that's a great trick, since we're here. Um, another good trick to do is if you end up with something like this and you can't get rid of it because it's obvious and it's dark, I'll go back to my clone stamp and I'll change the opacity to 50% thereabouts. So let's say, I, and I want some like lighter green. If I did 100, well there, that doesn't work because the edge, but in here, that looks somewhat reasonable, right? If I had done 100% though, let me show you what that looks like. If I do 100% of that light area over here, I end up with that harsh edge. So I'll do like a 50 or 40 or 30% and kind of just start painting. And again, that's where the tablet comes in because it's great to be able to kind of get that stroke. Uh, yeah? Are you going to talk about um, high, high dynamic range? No, I'm not going to talk about high dynamic range. No. And the thing is, HDR, first of all, there's good programs for doing HDR. Um, like uh, photomatics and stuff like that, but uh, typically HDR is, is a trick. What I wanted to do for this class was keep it to the basics of what it takes to get a good picture done. HDR is now taking it to the next level, and frankly, I'll be honest with you, I almost never do HDR. It's not that I don't do it, but I rarely do it, because it's not really what most people in the world are doing. I mean, RC Concepcion is great. The guys are really good at it. This is not something I do. So actually, the book, yeah, back there. What's that? Oh, skinny tool. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Let me show you how to make someone skinny. Let's do it. Uh, we have to find someone who's already skinny so I never get in trouble. Um, so um, let me see if I can do this here. Or actually, um, hold on. Let's see if we can pick on someone. Oh, we could do me. Yeah. yeah, all right. So there's a lovely picture of me. Um, if I want to make myself skinnier, so what I did is I just Command A for Select All. And I'll show you how I did the action in a minute. Uh, so let's see here. Actions, make skinny. Ready? See the difference? Oh, you do the whole image. Yeah, it's the whole image. Actually, I kind of like the skinny version of me better. <laughs> I just lost 17 pounds. Um, so all right, here's how it works. It's really, really easy. All I did is I just um, I took um, the file. I can't remember how I did it. Uh, hold on, let me look. Uh, 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 uh. I changed the width from 100% to 95.3%. So all I did is I just changed the width of the image by 5%. It's actually, it's not even 10% make skinny. It's more about a 5% make skinny. And I just wrote the action just like we did before. Record, make skinny, squish by 5%, done. And then as, if you make it a button, and button bar is nothing more than just going up here to the top to this and calling it button mode. Here's the advantage of button mode. If you are not in button mode, this is the way Photoshop ships. Okay. So if I want to do make skinny, I have to click on it and hit play. But if you go to button mode, literally all I do is just go, you notice how I have this reduce size here, 10%, 15%, 20%. And the reason I do that is people ask me all the time, can you email me this? Where? Well, what I do is if I, if I have a full size image, I got to get rid of my ugly face. OK. So um, here's an oversaturated bug. So um, and you know we want to make that smaller. I can just go reduce to 25% with one button. I don't have to hit play or anything. I just hit the button mode, and now it's 25%. So um, it's, it makes it easier because I tend to resize so much, wh whether it's for the blog or whatever. If I'm resizing a lot of images, I do this. So let's say uh, okay, we're in China. Um, oh, this is cool, Terracotta Warriors. If you guys haven't been there, you should go. Um, so um, if I want to resize all these image, Im images to send. I, I'll do it in, directly in Photo Mechanic, and, and I go save as uh, a, um, percentage 50% watermark it. And I'll either watermark it with my name or my logo, depending on what I want. And then uh, and I'll save it to a folder or a subfolder called uh, resized. And then it does it for me. Oh, how to watermark? Well, I, I usually watermark. There's two different ways of watermark. Watermarking inside of Photo Mechanic is automatic, as you saw right there, which is really cool. Because um, inside of Photoshop, here's the way. I'll tell you the best way to create uh, a watermark in Photoshop is uh, create a brush. All right, actually, let's just uh, let's watermark that image. OK, so I want to put my, uh, my watermark on this. Check this out. I created a brush with my logo. And uh, I can, whoa. So, uh, oh, what did I do here? Oh, I'm in clone stamp. Well, uh, hold on here. That was weird. Try it again. Brush, logo. Let's make it bigger. And uh, what color do you want? White or black? Let's go white. So um, what you can do is you can take anything, whether it's a signature or a dot or whatever you want, and make it a brush. So what you do is you create a new document inside of Photoshop. And we're going to assign. I'm going to go to Brush. And we're going to pick uh, a regular brush here. Let's make it a tad smaller, because that's going to be obnoxious. Hello. All right. And now I want to sign my name. Of course, we want to do it on black. So there's my signature. I want that to be my brush now. Okay. So what you can do is you can go in and you can uh, go to uh, image. How, there's a way to make this a brush. Hold on here. Define brush. Is that the one? Ha! 
define brush presample, call it logo or signature. Ta da! Now I can paint with my signature. So now, let's get rid of this. And if I want to put my signature on this, I can. How big do we want? There it is. So let me just do it quickly again. New document. <laughs> let's go back to a regular brush here for a second. So what I would do is if you have a logo, you could just bring up your logo. In this case, we'll bring up the, um, um, whoops. So I'm going to just, and one of the great things again about the graphics tablet is I can just, you know, do whatever I want, blah, 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 blah. And then all you do is go to uh, edit, define brush preset. And that's the easiest way. Now, the other thing you could do is you could create this as a 50% opacity and throw it across the middle if you want. And there's ways to automate this as well. I, I actually like this because when I created my logo as a brush, I can drop it on whatever corner I want. As opposed to automating, I really I hate watermarks that go across the middle of an image. Mm -hmm. I still do it like when I present to clients, but I make it really opaque. But I would prefer to look at an image and go, this one would be better up here, this one would be better down. So on my blog, like I try to make it so you guys can see the images. Now, and I finally figured out a couple months ago how to make the images bigger, and get the, the and I get the watermark. I try to get the watermark out of the way because I I, I want to protect my images, but not to the point where it makes them ugly. Yeah. When you're shooting, do you uh, manually set your ISO, or do you have it on auto? When I shoot, do I manually set my ISO? Always set my ISO manually. I've almost never used auto ISO. I used one time at the Olympics just to try it, and it actually worked okay. But um, I want control, when I'm shooting, I want control of my camera, mainly the aperture, because the most important thing to me is what, what is my depth of field that I want, or how much, if it's a night shot, how much motion do I have by determining the shutter speed through my aperture. Um, but on, the ISO, if I'm shooting a night shot, my ISO is always 100. If I'm shooting a landscape during the day, ISO is always 100. If I'm shooting in here right now with no flash, <laughs> Uh, 6400, but or whatever. So I, I've shot enough. I, I kind of know based on where I am and what I want in the camera. Yeah, experience. Yeah, can. yeah. Yep. Uh, with the clarity, um, do you think you guys are getting thick like that for? The, the clarity slider? Yeah. Actually, the clarity slider is something I have played with. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is pretty cool. Um, I did start using that recently. Uh, let me go to back to our raw files here. Uh, let me find one that we can, here's bagels. This is uh, about as Jewish as you get, right? So um, so here's our bagels. And you'll see with the clarity slider, if I pull this, watch what happens. It, it sharpens and darkens, right? So I find the clarity slider, this is only plus nine. So it's just minor tweak there. I do, I do use a clarity slider at times if I want to get something a little sharper than just using sharpening. And I want to create a little bit more contrast in the image. Once in a while, I use it. That not, it's not part of the 90 rule, but 90% of the time, but I do use it a little bit. It does create halos, um, and it's, um, I find that it's not needed that often. Again, if you're shooting correctly, you shouldn't have to use it too much. Yeah, I'll get you. Yeah, the, the advantage of photo mechanic is this, ready? These are raw files. There, need to say more? Um, I will tell you that every photographer, um, I would say that uh, almost every photographer that shoots the Olympics will use photo mechanic by default. And the reason is Lightroom and Aperture have all these other thousands of things that they do, but we don't care about those. What we care about is I'm contractually obligated to Team USA to have images to them within two hours. So I just shot 3,500 images of USA water polo playing, or whatever it might be, or USA hockey, or whoever. I have to go through 3,000 images, find the best 10 or 15, find them, bring them into Photoshop, do the adjustments to exposure and contrast and stuff like that, white balance, and get them resized and back to the US all within two hours. So to me, every bit of speed, and I did a presentation on this uh, a couple months ago here about the Olympics, every second matters. Because you're working 9 a.m. till 2 a.m. 2 every day, and there's no break. Seriously, it's, this sounds weird, but at the Olympics, you eat because you're trying to sustain yourself, not for pleasure. You barely sleep. You don't think about anything other than photography. Every minute you're awake on a bus, 
whatever you're editing and posting. So we have dongles. You got, it's, it's, it's insanity. It's fun, but it's like it's all about speed. And photo mechanics just blind fast. Even in a two-hour window, do you ingest it, or you just? No, two hours is everything. That means shooting, getting done shooting, going to the mix zone, which is where the athletes mix with the press. Shooting there, running upstairs, downloading while you're cleaning, you know, putting gear away and getting your remotes. You or, so you're ingesting. I'm doing everything myself. So it's ingesting, going through with them, retouching them, FTP back, and then and then you're on the press bus to the next the next thing. Yeah. So if you want to adjust, if you want to adjust, if you're making adjustments to an image and you want to apply them to all other images, generally that's done inside a program like Lightroom. So the stuff that I'm showing you here, most of it applies to Lightroom, like luminance slider and exposure and shadows and highlights. And there, the cool thing is you can take an image and you can say, copy all of the settings I just adjusted to this picture mm -hmm. and do it to all of these pictures. But again, the problem I have with that is look at the difference in lighting between this shot, OK? Let me go through here. Oh, even, even just between like that one and like that one's very black. If you look at the suits, it's very dark. And the reason is because the camera's getting fooled by all the light. So it's darkening. It's, it's, so the, the blacks are too black. So I'm going to adjust that one differently than this one, and this one, and even these. Like, look at the difference in exp exposure between these two. Mm -hmm. This one here, I might brighten this one. If I brighten this by 20 percent, I don't want to brighten that one by 20 percent. It's already bright enough. So what? And, and I'm adjusting in camera constantly when I shoot. Um, and one of the things that I do is I adjust the, I'm using live view and I'm like manually focusing. I actually zoom in to get eyelashes. This is blow you away. I use a, at least a three or 400 millimeter lens. I get into eyelashes and once I get the eyelashes in tight, I start shooting. Now if the kid starts doing this, which drives me crazy, then I'm either, re I'm either refocusing or I'll go from two eight to five six. Like, okay, so the case of something like this, I can focus on his head. I don't really care. Here, I have two people. I can. That's we're cool. Now you start doing this. If I shoot this at two eight, mm -hmm. someone's gonna be out of focus. Now I gotta be at five six or six three, which means I'm starting to lose shutter speed. So I'm I'm adjusting all the time, and that's why global adjustments don't really work for me. Now white balance yeah, maybe. Tripod. This is all tripod. Okay. You yeah. One, uh, on a shoot like this, I'll use one camera in the back of a temple or church, but I always have a second one handheld. So when that kid walks that Torah, this one stays up there with a the big 400 millimeter. I grab the other one. The other thing I like to do in an event is I'll do all the tight shots like this. I love to get a wide shot of the temple, which I may or may not have done on this one. Um, yep, and here it is. And again, you'll notice when I shot this, um, it was, I think it was a 16 to 35, yep, 16 uh, to 35 lens. And I knew when I shot it that I was metering for the kid, this is going to be dark. But again, I showed you how I could just create that, that um, the gradation, and I'll lighten this up, take a couple seconds. When you were taking this photo, were you all the way in the back? All the way in the back. Oh, well, actually, a lot of times I'll be all the way in the back. It depends on the service. If they don't fill the stands, uh, I'll move up a little bit. Granted, as long as the clergy is cool with me moving, this guy, the rabbi of this temple, is really tough. He doesn't even want you moving. Like, the minute, like if you <coughs> if you cough, he's like, no. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, and and so, um, like, I've, I've actually I've actually had him uh, like one time. I was shooting him by the ends here. You can tell. Well, he wants you shooting like way at the corner, and he actually, as they're walking with the Torah processional, he's like. Get out of here! Like, like seriously, like, okay. And, and I've shot there a lot of times. So, but if they have a large crowd, then you want to show that large crowd. If they don't, the last thing you want to do is go, hey, look how many empty seats you had, right? So, um, so well, that's what. I'll, and sometimes I'll just rack the zoom in a little bit more if they don't have a huge crowd. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. A couple of shots back, you mentioned the camera is being fooled by the brightness. Y yep. Um, That's correct. I'm, uh, well, it depends. I'll shoot a combination of manual or aperture priority. Um, most of the time, an aperture priority, even in this case. And the reason is it works. Do you have um, set up your own nope, one camera. No, I don't, no remotes. Oh, no flash allowed. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Actually, it was really funny because I did uh, I did a bat mitzvah in San Francisco. They spent over a million dollars on a bat mitzvah, and um, yeah, 160 grand just on flowers. 
They should have spent it on a photographer. Um, <laughs> they actually had seven photographers. They had, their, they had their family photographers, and then they hired me because I understand the service, and they wanted someone. Their family photographers are Asian, and they wanted, but they wanted someone who understood the Jewish ceremony. So I was there for that, mm -hmm. and they told these guys, "You do not move." The different temple, much bigger temple than this one, mm -hmm. and they didn't listen. So they're thinking it's like a wedding. So they're all over the place on the on the balcony, not downstairs. They move around the balcony, and uh, they came upstairs and they wanted to boot. They wanted to eject every one of them, and they told them, "You'll never shoot here again." And I, was, I, I had got there early, put my, my uh, Gitzo tripod right in the middle on the top, in front of the balcony, I had the best spot. And I just sat there the whole time just firing off my shots. And when they started kicking everybody out, I just looked at them like, oh, and they go, you're good. But, but when you're shooting in a temple or a service, you better be aware of what the rules are. You know? and, and here's the, tr the fact of the matter is, rules are meant to be bent, not broken. I mean, at the Olympics, there was a shot um, it's in here. Um, let me sort by capture time. It's my wife's favorite shot from the Olympics, so you can find it. What are the colors in here? Color coding. Uh, I color code my images, so um, really, I didn't put it in here. Wow. Um, so color uh, purple means it's it's a uh, done and edited. Uh, typically, like if you go back to our, our mitzvah here for a second, what you'll see is uh, yellow means it's posted for the family. Typically, uh, um, let's see if I have any orange. Posted like onto an online gallery. Onto the online gallery, so there's 500. The, the orange means the ones I really liked, and I probably modified it for this presentation. And then the red is an absolute money shot. And I made them red here just so I can get to them easily to show you guys. So these are not money shots. But I mean, I'm looking, what I'm really looking for in a, in, in a bar mitzvah or, or whatever is the key moment. Uh, so let me go sort here by capture time. Like, like even this shot, this is just the grandfather, great light coming in through the window. Or um, you know, something that tells a story, so here's some more recent stuff, where good reactions, like that's, a, that's one that would be higher ranked, um, like that one. Um, you know, key moments. Uh, this was one I shot, uh, this was shot at 1.4 using the uh, Sigma 8514, no flash using the ambient light from a projector um, just to light the kid, which I love doing stuff like that. But um, this is a fisheye lens. I got bored. When I shoot events and there's kids dancing at a bar mitzvah, after about three hours of shooting kids dancing, and you're like, what the heck are they shooting now? So I'll start throwing on different lenses and things. Um, and so this is a, an example of using a fisheye. Um, but just trying different stuff. There's an, this is one of my favorite things to do, is, is to use that 8514 and shoot with ambient light when they do the candle lighting ceremony and turn off the flash and just use the light from the candles, which you can only really do after about the eighth candle because you need a lot of light. But um, the, the, it's, it's just an awesome thing to do. I like the Sigma for two reasons. One, it's a little bit lighter, but more importantly, it's half the price. So um, the Sigma 85, it's been 85 1.4, and it's been uh, an absolute godsend. I love that one. I do. Well, I mean, look at it. I mean, it's, it's a very sharp image. Um, it seems to focus very quickly. Um, it's, like I said, the 85 1.2 from Canon is an amazing lens, but it's really heavy. So. It's it's a, it's top heavy. I don't know if that, it's front heavy, if that makes sense. Curtis, do you, when you're focusing, do you primarily use a spot focus? Yeah, around, o almost always I'm center focus, center point focus. I so you're what? Yes, when I, even when I do a portrait of someone, I will keep center point on most of the time. I'll I'll, I'll focus on the eye and then reshift the camera and press the rest of the way down. There are, are rare times, uh, if I know I'm doing almost all portraits, I'll move the focal point to the top. On the 1DX, I've got way more focal points to play with. On the 5D Mark III, it's a little less. But I almost, I, I like that center point. The only challenge is when you're shooting with the 8514, you have to be careful that when you focus on the eye and you reposition, you're, you're not changing too much because you'll lose focus. Because the depth of field is so tight at 1.4. Yeah. And your magic luminous number was 67, right? What's that? Your magic luminous number was 67. Yes. Yeah, the luminance slider, it, it doesn't have to be 67, but around, oh, actually, yeah, lumino, that's luminance, that's sharpening. Luminance is around 28, oh, 28. I find. Oh, but again, it depends on the image. That one image we played with 28 wasn't enough. Yeah. By the way, before, so if anybody has more questions, come on up and ask me. I'll stick around as long as we need to. Thank you for coming, though. I appreciate it.
For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 